So while they're doing that, I should tell you, he is a writer for Iran Wire in English. So it's very important when you've got news sources who are very good on Iranian topics that they do an English branch. So Iran Wire English has been a great source of um, information for, for people who want to know more. And um, he, was also a lit he is also a literary critic, yes? Um, he used to be. He wrote a very important article in the Iran Wire English on the provenance of the weapons and the arms that the Islamic regime were using. And for a long time, it was the article that I linked to in my link tree because it was showing us that what was happening in Iran isn't an isolated thing that's over there, that weapons were um, Canadian and German and so on. And uh, that article that he wrote in Iran why was very revealing. And some of the companies that, you know, recent years when they should have been in sanctions, they sanctioned uh, with Iran. It turned out that that was the year they shouldn't have been doing. Anyway, I'm sure he'll tell you more about that himself. Um, he's also a project manager for Justice for Iran. He has an MA in American Studies from the U University of Torino in Italy. Dr. Shams has published several books, of poems and novels and translations of prominent American authors into Farsi. After receiving death threats for his writing, he left Iran for safety in Europe. So let's welcome him to here today. Thank you very much. Thank you for such a thorough introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Ayol. Uh, Barry and all organizers for this event. Today I'm going to talk about documenting human rights violations in the current revolution. Uh, so I'd like to, to start first with uh, how uh, the nature and form of protests uh, has changed since 2009. So it all started with 2009 when this huge protest over the disputed uh, results of presidential election happened in Iran, more than two million marched in the streets of Tehran and all across the world. Uh, and also, uh, mm, they faced with brutal uh, suppression. Hundreds were killed, thousands were arrested. Uh, we have documented cases of rape, sexual torture in so many different uh, uh, detention centers, specifically in one called Kahrizak, where several uh, prisoners were killed under torture. So, but the most important thing, what actually make this specific event uh, crucial is that this was uh, the first protest that was called the first Twitter revolution. It was the first um, large protest, which was almost 100% organized through the social media and internet. So protests were organized almost completely through social media. Another thing was that uh, the human rights violations was, was um, almost for the first time largely recorded uh, by ordinary citizens or citizen journalists. Another thing was that these uh, kind of videos, a um, huge amount of uh, visual material was uh, published on social uh, media platforms so it enabled the, the world to, to um, watch what's happening in the streets of Iran live and it's um, completely radically changed our approach toward documenting human rights uh, violations because previously what was, uh, happened was first in terms of organizing protests. If it uh, was a democratic or semi-democratic uh, society, the political party would have to uh, work for years uh, to, do, uh, to, to kind of mobilize huge uh, uh, demonstration that could actually lead to change or underground uh, groups had to do lots of political activities in order to, um, to actually radicalize and mobilize the, the, uh, the society. Now, this kind of organization would happen, uh, this mobilization would happen in a matter of minutes or uh, hours through the social media. Another thing was that uh, previously uh, for documenting human rights, these uh, human rights watchdog or the press had to be present on the field to do that. Now, we rely on a huge amount of data collected through the social media, and we are trying to, to work that especially is crucial for the kind of uh, situation uh, when you're documenting human rights violations in the in time of crisis in countries where the state is not actually willing to cooperate for, with the human rights watchdog to uh, document human rights violations, and you, uh, the press cannot actually be present. So. 
mm, um, today I'm going to mm, mainly focus on this, on how internet is essential for these new approaches towards documenting human rights violations and what are the challenges for that. So these are the opportunities that the internet and social media gave us since 2009. But there were threats coming with that. One of them was the transparency. So when the protesters organized through the social media, not underground and through secret uh, connections and networks, uh, it's quite transparent. So when these organizations are actually set a location and date and time, uh, almost immediately the government will realize what's going on and it has the ability to mobilize to, to prevent it. And on the other, so that is the uh, transparency on the surface. But on the other hand, those networks, users, and groups that are organizing, they are mostly work in, in total anonymity, and that would create an opportunity for the government to infiltrate, to launch uh, campaigns of disinformation, to mislead, and to kind of uh, work through uh, injecting incorrect information that would affect a, a process of, of documenting human rights uh, violations. So I'm going to walk through uh, the details of these challenges. But first, let's take a look at how we um, usually document human rights violations, especially in this current revolution. So these are the main goals of documenting human rights violations. We um, try to establish what happened, how and when it happened, who was involved, and uh, who was affected. And in order to do that, and then we will gather all this information and um, write our reports, which eventually... Uh, aims at holding the perpetrators uh, responsible. So how we do that, we mm, first compile all the audiovisual material and the evidence that we can find, and then we verify those evidence, we analyze them, and then we also collect the testimonies. And altogether, we built a bigger picture with details of what happened, actually. So, when we are working with the um, audiovisual uh, evidence, we mostly, these times, rely on the ordinary people, on the collectives inside Iran. So those uh, revolutionary cells inside Iran who are working actually to organize these protests or these militant groups or actually uh, um, at the same time helping us gather information, collecting data, some of them, for example, I'm directly in contact with uh, the Alliance of the uh, Youth Committees of Iran, which is an alliance uh, considerable of so many different uh, local uh, youth committees, are actually helping us find out what uh, companies or organizations are uh, selling CCTV and surveillance uh, equipment to Iran. So and we do these public calls, or we gather a just piles of uh, uh, audiovisual data and then we analyze them. And these data will um, eventually uh, be categorized into different issues. The types of violations, for example, if it's about excessive use of force or using uh, little weapons by the uh, police force or if it's about torture. Uh, it also uh, gives us some information about the victims, their identity, what happened to them and the perpetrators, those who were involved in these uh, human rights violations, their position and the type of their involvement. So when it comes to verif verifying this evidence, which is absolutely important because of what I just said, because of these disinformation campaigns, we use these two main techniques, geolocation and kernel location for the audiovisual material. Uh, we use the geolocation techniques to to find out uh, the exact location of those pictures and videos uh, uh, where they captured by comparing the details of those uh, material with the um, audiovisual material or the testimony that we already verified and we make, we're sure that they are correct. And then we use the kernel location to determine the time of a photograph or a video. And they will help us to understand if uh, whether the uh, video or the photo actually is what it claims to be or not. For example, here, what you see are two uh, officers of what we believe uh, from the special units of the law enforcement Iran, NOPO, here. Uh, one of them has a Dragunov sniper, and the other one has a binocular, uh, who is a watcher. And then we use these visual elements to pinpoint the exact location of these uh, uh, 
photo to, to see if it was actually happening during the uh, current revolution or not. So using those uh, elements, for example, that logo, which was from a travel agency, we uh, found out that this was a, a, a main square in Golshar in the city of Karaj, where most of the protests in Karaj actually happened, and several protesters were actually killed there. The in injuries on the, uh, some of the bodies, those that we could actually uh, verify, uh, they were killed by a direct shot and those injuries showed that they were uh, uh, shot by long-range, high-precision rifles, which could be a Dragunov sniper. And then we also used the, the weather, the other visual uh, uh, elements, to make sure that this was a recent photo, which it was. So it was taken in the uh, last few months. And then we also used these uh, visual analysis technique uh, to, uh, uh, to show, for example, how uh, lethal weapons were used in the several cities inside Iran, uh, despite the, the statements of the official that we, they, they say that the, the, the forces did not use uh, lethal weapons. We actually documented uh, IRGC forces using assault weapons and mainly AK-47s in several cities of Iran. And why it's important, uh, and just to, to, to go back to, to Farah's question about uh, IRGC's involvement in terrorist uh, and criminal uh, activities and the facts, this would show us that there are a, a widespread plan here, systematic plan for using lethal, lethal force against uh, civilian and peaceful protesters, and uh, breaking all types of uh, laws on use of uh, weapons. And it also shows that there were awareness about these, uh, these plans. For example, here, uh, we documented the, uh, uh, how the, uh, the use of these water cannon, and we tried to, to, to locate them uh, in several cities. And then we found out which companies actually sold them to Iran, which was Gino Motors, a, a North Korean company which sold them to Iran quite recently, uh, along with a variety of uh, police uh, and anti-riot equipments. And some of them were actually used for crimes against humanity, that, which is, is, um, I'll uh, address uh, a little bit later. Here, for example, we um, found out the, the manufacturers of these shotguns, which were used widely uh, all across the country and uh, led to blinding so many protesters. Here we found this, uh, the, the photo on the left uh, is from a video clip of training of the special units of, uh, of police uh, forces in Iran. And in, in one of that frames, uh, we saw this logo which says Katarai. And on the other side, you will see that uh, model of the tactical shotgun Katarai made by Akar, Turkish uh, manufacturer. Uh, on their website. And then we have, for example, this one, as you can see in the hand of that RGC uh, officer, you will see the Scott tactical shotgun made by the Hudson, another Turkish company. Uh, and these were used literally to, uh, to shoot people in the eyes, in the head, killing them, and shoot him, uh, shooting them in the crouch used as a means of inflicting pain intentionally or killing uh, protesters. And it was widespread, and it was systematic, and it happened with the awareness of the high rank official, which, are, which amounts to crimes against humanity. These are, legally speaking, three uh, main elements that if, if they, they are there, it will show that there is a plan of attacking civilians what, by killing, torching them, killing them, torching them, uh, and if it's systematic, widespread, and uh, there is awareness, that will amount to crimes against humanity. That is what we are trying to establish. We also went after those who were uh, involved in the suppression through providing uh, technology and equipment for surveillance that would uh, lead to identifying protesters, arresting them, torturing them, mm -hmm and eventually, in some cases, executing them. So here, for example, we have Milestone, a Danish company, who sold uh, these uh, facial recognition technology to Iran, 
As you can see here, Mr. Kamyab Darvishi, this is a, a license issued by the, this Danish company uh, for this Iranian uh, gentleman to, to actually use Exprotect, one of the ter most terrifying technologies for processing images and uh, using AI to, to process m millions of data in, in a matter of seconds or minutes. And uh, it also has facial recognition technology, which is used. Sorry? We, we cannot say exactly what, when, when it was, but they were usually between 2016 to 2019 that happened. But they're still there. For example, here what you see is, uh, as you can see, this is the, the, um, uh, the logo of Honeywell, quite famous company, American company. Axis, a Swedish CCTV company, these were selling these CCTV cameras to Iran for, uh, for, for a long time. And that is Tiandi, a Chinese company with the Iranian businessman. Uh, they also sent, uh, sold uh, facial recognition, smart uh, AI technologies for identifying protesters. After our report, uh, US and EU put Tiandi on sanctions. These two companies, although they deny that they are selling any uh, kind of product to Iran, and they deny that these people here are actually their sales representatives, although what ha what's happening is that their products are being sold to in Iran quite easily, and most important thing is that these pictures were taken in 2019 IPAS fair. IPAS fair is a, 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 some sort of annual fair organized and established by the Iranian law enforcement, uh, in which all the companies from across the world come there and um, uh, exhibit their um, latest technologies regarding the anti-riot police or surveillance, and, this, uh, and the Iranian uh, law enforcement will buy some of these technology from them. So you, as you see, Honeywell was there, Axis was there, and we have documents coming from these use committees that Axis is one of the main major brands in Iran uh, when it comes to the CCTV cameras. And then eventually, we will collect testimonies of the victims, witnesses, sources, and experts. For example, we published uh, dozens of reports about these protesters who have been blinded uh, or shot in the eye by the security forces. Uh, we interviewed dozens of the victims and doctors who actually examined them during the revolution, the, the, the protests. And we also talked to inside sources who told us that there were awareness about, what, about this plan, about this the liberation in shooting people in the eye in the higher rank uh, levels of the law enforcement officials and the IRGC, which then it will prove that there is all the elements here, widespread, systematic, and awareness which amounts to crimes against humanity. Again, we here, we talked to, we, we documented the use of child soldiers uh, as security forces in, uh, during these uh, protests. Uh, we talked to inside sources who told us about the program for training these children. As you can see in the picture, eight years old, nine year old, uh, 10, 11 years old uh, children were trained using assault weapons against protesters. And uh, we obtained these pictures talking to these inside sources and then uh, we geolocated the photos of uh, these child soldiers in the cities of uh, eight provinces inside Iran. Uh, so these are uh, the type of documents uh, and uh, documentations that we do. But the challenges that we're facing are quite pe peculiar uh, when it comes to internet and social media. So the list is the main challenges are the internet shutdown, mass surveillance, tempering uh, with the, uh, or destroying the evidence, uh, criminalizing human rights documentation, arresting, intimidating, threatening the, uh, the victims and the witnesses or their families, and broadcasting false or false confession, and eventually uh, the blockings and takedowns. So I'll just quickly go through some of these. The, the major problem we have, the internet shutdown and mass surveillance, because the internet shutdown not only affect the way that the protesters organize, it also affects the, the, the flow of inf information, and it will uh, eventually disrupt the live coverage of the, uh, the protest and what's happening on the ground, which also affects our um, mission uh, to document humorous violation. Less videos will come out. 
and uh, there will be problems interviewing the witnesses. And the important thing about that is that in some of these cases, especially when it comes to interviewing the uh, victims or witnesses, it is a quite time-sensitive issue because as time passes, the victims, especially the victims, they will forget the details of what happened or for the reasons that Shiva and uh, Said uh, told us. They might just mm, kind of uh, lock down part of these uh, memories and try not to remember them. And those memories are crucial to, uh, to somehow to identify the perpetrators or to understand what exactly happened. Uh, so it really affects our work. And another thing is with the mass surveillance. Now with these European uh, companies, also Russia and China, selling very, very high-tech uh, and advanced technology to Iran, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, government can trace uh, even turned off or, uh, phones with discarded SIM cards. And they can track the movements of the, 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 the phone holders. Because of that, many protesters now will be forced to leave their smartphones at home, which means less videos will come out, and some of these incidents, some of these events will never, ever be recorded and will forever be lost. Another issue we have is criminalizing human rights documentation. When it comes to dictatorship, countries like Iran, uh, the state, instead of cooperating with the human rights watchdog, it will actively try to, to stop them by using several laws as pretext to, to, to stop them or to punish them. We have these two notorious laws in Iran, Article 500 of the Islamic Penal Code, which uh, criminalizes uh, propaganda activity or in favor of uh, any uh, organization opposing to, to, to Iranian uh, government or uh, against the Islamic Republic in general, which is a very vague, ridiculous law. Uh, legally speaking, and that will be used as a pretext to, uh, to criminalize even sending reports to the UN because it will uh, be in, uh, interpreted as doing something that would be considered as propaganda against the regime. So uh, many human rights defenders were, uh, were actually imprisoned using that law as a pretext. Also, Article 508 of the Islamic Penal Code which is just outrageous. It says anyone or group that who cooperates uh, with hostile foreign countries in any way against Islamic Republic of Iran will be sentenced to one or ten if they are not recognized as Muharreb, which is punishable by death. So using that as a, pre a pretext, they criminalize even the victims who are interviewing with the media outlets or human rights watchdogs who are based abroad. Uh, under the context that they are living in hostile countries and it would be eventually be uh, cooperating with the hostile governments. Then we have the issue of tempering with uh, or destroying the evidence. Uh, what was quite unprecedented in uh, terms of tempering with the evidence or destroying evidence in this uh, revolution was that we f witnessed a very particular and well sophisticated uh, designed plan for uh, destroying evidence. For example, when it comes to, to collecting the, the injured or the killed protesters, there was this plan when, when the ambulances came. Uh, there was always one security agent on board of that ambulance. Then they will collect the injured or the killed. They will transfer them to, to a hospital. There will be another uh, uh, intelligent agent uh, there they will quickly remove the person and transfer them, if, if it's possible, to a military hospital. Then they will force the medical staff of the hospital not to uh, register them into, the, uh, into their system. And then uh, they will also, in many cases, force the medical staff to leave the medical record blank or not even file the medical record or put a false or uh, incorrect information in the uh, medical uh, file, for example, including the cause of death, uh, such as uh, natural cause of death or, uh, I don't know, uh, heart attack, suicide mostly, yes, exactly. And then what we had, which was very unique in this time, was staging the crime scene. So we had several cases that we documented. Three of them were uh, Atif and Naomi, Aydar Ossami and uh, Behnaz Afshari. So uh, 
Atifa Naomi was a civil rights uh, activist who lived in Tehran, and then uh, one day uh, she was found dead in her apartment, wrapped in a blanket with a uh, uh, house uh, connected to a gas canister next to her mouth. And then when the homicide team arrived, the first thing that they said as their family uh, uh, said in their testimony was that this was not a suicide. This is not a suicide. It just doesn't work like that. And then the, the security forces quickly buried the, the body, which is also a pattern. In all of these cases, the, the quick burial uh, is something that happened for almost every single uh, kill protester that we documented. And then they, they didn't let the, the family to, to go through investigation and to understand and to, to see what was the actual cause of death. And they closed the case immediately, took it from the, uh, the homicide police and gave it to the intelligence, uh, which is quite um, odd because if it was, as they informed the family, a suicide, then what would be the reason for that? Another case which was very, very, uh, uh, quite a famous case, was the case of Aydar Sami, Dr. Aydar Sami, She was uh, uh, treating the injured uh, mm. protesters uh, during the protest and was then found dead. And the, the family was informed that she, was, uh, she died in a car accident first. And uh, then the, the medical staff, when the family went to see the body and they didn't let them, the medical staff there, maybe out of sim sympathy uh, with, the flow, uh, with the fellow uh, medical uh, Doctor, they just told them that we saw the body and this is not a car accident. What we saw, the marks on the body, will not match a, a car accident case. This was a case of severe beating. And then uh, another odd thing that happened was that a week after that, when the government actually announced that this was a car accident, they arrested a person uh, allegedly for murdering. Uh, and then in during, uh, and then they broadcast his confessions which didn't match at all with ne neither the, the original uh, story of the government or with the body marks that the medical staff saw and told us. And then we had the case of Behnaz Afshari, a student who was found dead in a hotel room uh, the family was uh, told that she uh, committed suicide using, uh, by drug overdose but then when the family saw the body, it was covered in blood. There was a deep cut from neck, from ear to ear. And uh, what happened was that, they, they, uh, again, there was no homicide team. What happened was that the, the intelligence officers actually came and told the family what happened. And then they quickly buried uh, the body and didn't let the investigation, didn't give the, the, the file to the homicide. And, they just close the case and threaten the family into silence. And that will take us to the, not to the other issue, the false confessions, disinformation, and smear campaigns. This is something that happens mm, mainly to discredit what we document, what we're trying to, to, to establish as facts of stories. These false confessions of the victims or the, their family will be broadcast just to discredit what we actually found. And, it's, and it has a huge effect on what we do. Why? Because in most of these cases, we are relying on, partly on the testimonies of the, the, either the victims or their family. So when they force the victims or the family uh, to, to, to deny what we actually said, then there will be a huge problem. For example, in 2020, we published this report on the IRIB, the state TV uh, news network in Iran, uh, we documented uh, cases of forced confession and smear campaigns against 355 individuals. All of these forced, false confessions were obtained under either physical or mental torture. And then the victims also mentioned that watching these uh, confessions broadcast on t state TV was also an additional type of uh, psychological torture for them. So here, for example, we have the very famous case of Nikasha Karami, 16 years old girl who went missing in Tehran during the protests on 20th of September. She found dead 10 days later with uh, visible marks of severe beatings. All her teeth were knocked out and uh, lots of bruises. So 
uh, her uncle and her aunt w were arrested exactly mm, hours after they posted a message online about her death. And then on Wednesday night, uh, the state TV show the broadca broadcast the, the confessions of uh, her aunt, Atasha Karami, uh, saying that Ni uh, Nika was not killed but just fell from a building. And then her uncle uh, came on TV denouncing uh, the protests. Uh, and then while he was talking, there was, a, I don't know if you can actually see it, I'll uh, play the video there was a shadow of a man on the left side next to him sitting and uh, telling him uh, to uh, exactly what he says uh, in Farsi, he said, Begu uh, Lajan, which means kind of, well, say it, you scumbag. And you can see it here. The shadow. Sadamebe, amwal umumi, yo afrod beshe hemayat ke nemi konim, mahkum ham mi konim. And so here we uh, kind of reinforced. Here in this uh, video, if I can actually show you, yeah. we uh, kind of reinforced the voice so you can hear the guy saying the words. Yeah, so. This is what we are up against, as you can see. Uh, in terms of forced confession. And eventually, what we uh, uh, were up against was blocking and takedowns, which mainly comes from these social media policies in terms of service. In uh, May 2022, uh, so many uh, accounts, Persian accounts, uh, experienced massive takedowns even blocking or suspending accounts. Among them was one of the most important uh, documentation networks, uh, uh, the account 1500 Tasvir or Hazar Punsat Tasvir, which is one of the major collectives anonymously working, documenting human rights violations in Iran. Also, the major um, Persian media outlet, Iran International, was also uh, targeted by these massive takedowns. And the reasons for them is mainly graphic violence or, I don't know, using slogans as hashtag like death to uh, Khamenei, death to dictators, which will be considered as hate speech or threatening to violence. And then the massive reports by the regime cyber army, which we call them user-generated censorship, which is organized attacks using hired uh, real or unreal uh, accounts to mass reporting certain accounts in order to shut them down. The important issue here is that some of these accounts or some of these social media platforms actually take down these kind of information in because they are graphic or quite violent, and that's true. But the problem is that the content that they are removing are evidence, are evidence that can be used in the court for actually identifying what happened. Thank you. Thank God. Thank you so much. I really need that. These are important, crucial information that will be lost forever. So the least they can do, and we keep telling them to do that, is to create a database, put these in, uh, content there, give us and the other researchers, human rights defenders, access to these kind of, kind of information because these are evidence. You cannot simply remove uh, atrocities in Syria or Iran because they are mm, graphic. Be these are information that mm, the world needs to have access to to, in, to, be, mm, to be able to determine what happened and the types of human rights violations that happened. So this is a major issue that we are dealing with. Again, these platforms saying that we are not taking down accounts based on mass reporting, total lie. They are doing that, and that's very easy to do that. We, tested that it's possible and it's there and it's one of the major issues that we are dealing with. Thank you so much. Um, sorry it took so long and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. 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 Has anyone got a question for Omid or something they'd like him to explain more about? 
Vital. Well, we mo mainly publish these on uh, Iran Wire, or we mm, wrote them in terms of in, in reports for uh, either for the international bodies like UN or Fakman Mission. But yes, they did. Uh, Iran International several times uh, uh, invited me to talk about, for example, about that uh, report on forced confession. Uh, we had a chance to talk on BBC and Iran International extensively about the details of the, the, the report, what happened, and how we actually gathered that data. And uh, some of these uh, media outlets, they also they do their own kind of documentation on uh, in these issues, which, uh, for example, uh, about the case of Behnaz Afshari, we have fantastic work of Mariam Afshang uh, about uh, that uh, documentary, which is Im amazing, so, so meticulous, really, really important for everybody to see how a proper investigation into human rights violation should look like. And uh, yes, so occasionally, but not all the time, they mostly invite me to, to do, like, as a political analyst, about, which I would love to actually talk about these kind of things, uh, than political uh, stuff, yeah. Well, um, first of all, um, most of these, Europe, in terms of the European uh, companies, you know, they, 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 not, uh, have to, they don't have to actually comply with the U.S. sanctions. They just do because they are afraid of the U.S. But in terms of the American company, we actually contacted Hon Honeywell, asked them that how it happened. They said, yes, we did have some business uh, uh, relationship with Iran, but we see that. Uh, after the re reinstatement of the uh, sanctions. But what happens is this. So these companies, Iranian companies, they will go to Dubai. They get um, a relationship with uh, some local businesses there. They buy these kind of CCTV cameras, equipments from Dubai, and then bring them uh, back to Iran. What we ask, ask them is that you have to do the due diligence based on two important international com uh, uh, documents. Uh, the UNGP, and OECD, which is uh, two major uh, convention documents that um, kind of encourages, because they are not legally binding, encourages the, the businesses to do the downstream due diligence to make sure that their product will not end up in the hands of the dictators. It doesn't matter if you're not directly selling them to them. What ma matters is that they are there. If you are not selling something to Myanmar, for example, or to China, which could be used for torture or for um, violating human rights, but they can actually easily access it through your different uh, local agents or sales representative, it, it is practically selling them that. Un the only thing is that you're not uh, viable uh, because, uh, legally because you are not literally s uh, selling them legally. Yeah, so that is the big problem that we have. And we are trying to kind of uh, pursue them to, to kind of find a, a maybe a legal way to, to force them to, not, to stop this, kind of. Thank you, Omijan. I really enjoyed <laughs> Can I also contribute something, some data? Please, Just because please, <laughs> maybe we are on the same page. Sure. And <laughs> I, actually, I was about to show you some mm, plots. And I don't know that where is Farijun? Can you help me with that? Uh, because, you know, as a data scientist, we also uh, work on data and visualization. There is some data that shows uh, the most of the cause of this is unknown. This is just exactly what you highlighted, and thank you. And I really enjoyed the reason behind the challenges of why uh, we don't have access to these references, and the data is really is all is misinformation that around from Iran and we cannot access exactly yes this is the plot that I was about to show you is the source of this data is 
from Harana, and it showed if you have a look at the y-axis that the second uh, bar is on, is it the cause of death? As you can see, this on now that the most of the, you know, that is huge that we cannot know what happened to them. And we know that lots of victims, but the cause of this is on now. And I think that it's, you know, it's so heartbreaking, heartbreaking that, for example, your loved one are died and we don't know what happened. And exactly. No yeah. one knows. And also you... Also the same happened in 2019. Uh, when, when we tried to establish the exact number of those who killed, yeah. we had 5,000 uh, unexplained death or death that uh, the cause of them was uh, considered as unknown. So, and that was a 5,000 increase, which showed that in this year, we had like 5,000 out of ordinary yes. order of uh, normal death uh, rate in Iran. So this is also how we can very, very vaguely and generally anticipate uh, the number of death during a protest. Yes, thank you. Another uh, plot to show you is, is because the plot talked to us, I think. <laughs> I click. That I would like to mention that <coughs> it's the woman led revolution, but don't forget that how, you know, that how many male victims we have. You know, this is uh, separated by female and male and shows the number of victims in the uh, excess. And you can find that the number of male victims that is more than, I think, two uh, times or three times more than the female. And uh, we don't forget that. This is the woman-led, but uh, you know, our men are by our side. And it's important to highlight that the victims is more than female. Yeah, thank you. Yes, the number of victims of male. Yes, this is the male. And the other one is female. From here is zero. It's also started from zero again. And this is the number of victims for female. And this is from two to 200 for male. And the y-axis is you can find the number of, the, sorry, the uh, cause of death. This is, for example, the pink one is hit by car or tear gas, or for example, beaten to death. The, uh, you know, the yellow one and the other ways, and the first and the biggest is bullet wound, and that the, the early morning was showing that how, you know, hard it would be. And they, yes, they just die. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have, I have a question. So, sure. um, when you're doing all this work, um, there's it's obviously like limited resources, limited time, you have your family commitments, you have your other interests. How fit is your team like so you collect all the data do you have a separate team that then takes that data and lobbies it is there a link up between action after you've done all that work and you know, all that expertise and verification is there then a team who are adept and able to then go and lobby to different places and say look we have this data we you need to act on it yeah well mm, we do have some teams that will work on advocacy it depends on uh, the type of work that we do, or the the platform that we publish it, or we, we do the work for. Uh, for example, when it comes to uh, the CCTV companies, uh, we managed to put Dahua and Tiandi on sanction list, both in the US and the EU. After the report was published in Iran Wire, uh, the Iran Wire and some other teams and advocates from other uh, organizations read the, uh, the article and also read the other reports of, from similar posts from other organizations. They kind of compile them all together, send them to the, the MPs, send them to the uh, uh, congressmen in uh, the US and some also, I think three, four congresswomen also ask questions in the Congress about, uh, uh, about this and then eventually it happened. They put the, uh, these two on the blacklist, uh, uh, business or trade blacklist in the US and also put them in sanction here. We managed after, for example, we published a, uh, with the Justice for Iran and SOMO, which is an organization who actually monitors 
the, uh, the compliance of the business uh, companies with human rights. We published uh, an art joint article on the CCTV and the companies were actually providing uh, suppression equipments. After that, again, uh, uh, I think the EMP uh, Batala asked a question in the European Parliament about how we can uh, kind of strengthen the downstream due diligence for the companies to make sure that this will not happen again. Uh, so these are the, the kind of teams or, or groups. The very good, thi good thing about uh, the early days or the peak of the revolution uh, was that everybody would work together without even saying it, without even asking. You would have a perfect harmony between the organizations and groups who were just following each other and working with each other, supporting each other without even need, a need to communicate directly and ask them. We would see that if there is something there, we would use it, we would reference it, we would support it, we would do anything that we could. We work at the, at the time, for example, with CNN on several um, investigations that they had. I'm not at liberty to say which ones. And uh, they use our sources, we use their, uh, their resources to, to work on several issues. So it was there. But now, these days, mm, it's a little bit different right now. So we have different teams working on issues. We have teams that gather raw data, and then we have teams that analyze them, walk through them, then turn them into a meaningful report, and then we will have some organization or just specifically work on advocacy. They will use these reports and we'll do that. How do you see the future of the revolution? Well, uh, it depends. Uh, there are, uh, well, what I think is that the, those days where Swiss were really crowded and on fire, everybody was really optimistic. I wasn't. Because I know, uh, despite what you said, although I have all the sympathy with everything that you said about this, the youth generation, I think revolution needs so many things to happen, including money, organization, structure, plan, and mm, leaders who are willing to go far enough, make difficult decisions to make it happen. We need so many things that we don't have and or we didn't have. We needed education for the masses. And when, I, when it comes to education for the masses, I'm, I'm not talking about that, the, some sort of a communistic idea of masses of education. I would uh, quote a 21-year-old brilliant leader, Fred Hampton from the Black Panthers, when he said that masses learn through observation and participation. You want them to, to learn something, if you want them to, to, if you want to train them into certain type of political awareness, you need to, to create a, a problem, show them the problem, then solve the problem, then show them how this would work in different situations. Then they will use that as an analogy and they will use it in order to, uh, to solve other problems and that will create uh, some sort of a politically aware, politically sensitive uh, generation. Uh, that generation can change uh, huge things. So for, for the current situation, I, I will say that uh, there will be, again, uh, huge demonstrations very soon, maybe when they, they um, announce the new price for petrol. There will be huge uh, demonstrations. There are some uh, preparations on, uh, on behalf of these or underground organizations in contact with, the, some of them are working on that to, to create a better plan for this demonstration, make sure that the less casualty will happen and more impact will be uh, secured and guaranteed. But there are so many things that needs to, ha to happen. There are things that you have to do which is not something that you would want to. For example, you have to talk to bastards because if you don't talk to bastards, to rich bastards, they will go and find your enemies. And if they go and find your enemies, you're fucked because 
They, you, cannot, you cannot just fight a revolution. You cannot win a war with slogans and ideas. Ideas are the core, the, the beating heart of a revolution. If you have pure ideas, progressive ideas, you have something to fight for, that is for sure. But that is not enough. You have to make sure of all the elements and variables that are in, in, in play, and you have to have a plan for every single one of them. Otherwise, you will be surprised, and when you're surprised, you, you will eventually be frustrated and defeated. The, there are so many things at play, at, play at, the, at, at the moment. We lost in so many fronts. We won in so many others. We showed the world that we have the most progressive movement in Iran. I mean, what is more progressive than a whole nation on fire over the women's right and then being led by the women in a very progressive revolution? So we showed that, we secured it, we guaranteed that, but then there are so many other things, the structure, the support, the supply for the revolution, they are not there, and people are not realistic enough about them. I agree. I agree. I think the, the political awareness is going up and is quite a, a positive thing. It's really promising. But at the same time, the revolutionary knowledge of people is not going as fast as, uh, up as fast as it should be. For example, uh, when it comes to how the government uh, faces these protests and confront and try to suppress them, uh, I. Uh, I look at these protests from 2009 till 2023, and I see a pattern, how the government uh, thrived in um, more effectively suppress. So what we had as a random cases of rape or sexual torture or killing protests turned into a very well-planned, very, very sophisticated plan for destroying a, a, a morale of a generation to kind of committing genocide, to creating an environment of terror, while you will keep the casualty as low as uh, possible. For example, in uh, 2019, they killed 1,500, they, only, they killed only 300 in marshes of um, uh, Mahsha using heavy machine guns. We didn't uh, document one single use of heavy machine guns this time. In, in this revolution. Only these shotguns and AK-47. Only one uh, case of uh, bringing heavy machine guns into the streets was documented in late, late in San Andaj and some uh, uh, small cities like Saqqez, but it wasn't used. So they learned, they learned from what they did. The Iranian people, the protesters, in many cases, they don't learn from their own mistakes before. They still, they still don't take the anonymity and the importance of face covering uh, serious enough. I mean, that is the simplest thing that you can do when you go into the streets. You have to cover your face. That is very simple, and we do that. We train people. We, we have lots of videos and pamphlets about how to do that. So many people, they just don't, and they just get caught. And when they are caught, a network of their friends and families will be in danger. So this is important. When people learn and they take it seriously, they think that, okay, this is a war. And in a war, you have to first be serious, and then you have to use every single tool in your dis at your disposal to crush your enemy. And that is it. There is no something in between. You either crush it, you will destroy, destroy them on every level, from the propaganda to social, cultural, political, or you will just lose because you are up against a, a completely unethical government that will do anything. So these are my relictums. That is, that is true, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree, I agree. I agree, I think there is one thing uh, for a regime to fall apart. And there's another thing for a regime to be changed and replaced with something progressive, as our friend there said. It's quite different. So a regime can eventually get into a crisis of legitimation and fall apart. And then another suppressive um, 
semi-democracy, quasi-democratic uh, regime take, take over, or you can have a progressive revolution that would be envy of the world. Yeah, I'm not disappointed. I'm just not as optimistic as everybody else is. Okay, on that beautiful note, thank you all so much. Can I just say something? Thank you. Thank you.